What's up, guys? You're now listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today is day 82, and we're going to cover Judges chapter 3 through 5. Last time we left off seeing our guy Joshua die, and we started seeing the downward spiral of Israel. It said that they forsook the Lord for Baal and Ashtaroth. And God also said that he allowed the nations to remain and not be driven out, and he didn't give them into the hand of Joshua to test the people who will remain after the death of Joshua. So we move into chapter three and we get our first judge. Now don't forget our cycle. Israel sins, then they go into captivity and persecution to one of the nations that are in the land. They repent, God raises up a judge and delivers them and it starts all the way back over again. They sin again. And this is the vicious cycle of all of judges. It's a downward spiral. But our first judge is honorable. His name is Othniel. He's come up before in Joshua, but he came up earlier in Judges, giving an account of the land he took in Joshua, but he turns out to be a judge. Let's grab that in verse nine. It says, when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them. Othniel, the son of Kiza, Caleb's younger brother, the spirit of the Lord came upon him Remember, that's key. When we see language like that, something special is about to happen. This is what happened with Bezalel and the Holy Ab when they built the tabernacle. This is what happened with Moses, the 70 elders, Joshua. And now we see it again here. The spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war and the Lord gives him. Then the land had rest for 40 years. So under the judge Othniel, the land has 40 years of rest which means this is the relief that God provides even in their disobedience before they run into another oppressor that they didn't drive out the land. But then in verse 12, it says, Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. So now you have another oppressor by the name of Eglon, and he's the king of Moab, and he oppresses them for 18 years. Now we get another judge that is raised up to deliver them from Moab. But one thing I want you to notice is you'll start to see the decline in the character of the judges as we continue to read more and more. So Othniel is one of our most righteous judges. And now we start to see a decline. Othniel engaged in righteous pitch battle. Now our second judge, Ehud, is not going to do that. He's going to engage in unsanctioned means, illegal assassination. So what you have here is Ehud is left-handed. And because he's left-handed, he can hide his weapon in a way where people wouldn't search him. And he could easily get in and assassinate someone. And so you see the text highlighting that. In verse 15, it says he's a left-handed man. And then in verse 16, it says that Ehud made himself a sword, which had two edges, and bound it on his right thigh under his cloak. So you wouldn't check this side because it was rare to be left-handed. And now the text pokes fun at the king who oppresses them. Eglon, it says in verse 17 that he was a very fat man. And the text does that. It's embarrassing the character to show that there's something wrong with him, that he's been dishonoring the Lord in some way. And so Ehud comes up to this King Eglon and he says in verse 20, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. Ehud stretched out his left hand, took his sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And look at how graphic the text gets. It says the handle also went in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade. And he did not draw the sword out of his belly. And the refuse came out. Then Ehud, he went into the vestibule, the bathroom, and shut the doors, the roof chamber behind him, and locked them. And so he's in here, and his servants think that he's just relieving himself because they probably smell the smell of what just happened. So they don't check on them. They wait until they became anxious. It says this in verse 25, and they took a key and opened the door, and the, and their master had fallen on the floor dead. And that's our second judge. That's how he defeats the king of Moab. And that land gets 80 years of rest from this. It says that in verse 30. But now remember, some of these judges 
were judging around the same time. For instance, the Moabites would have been on the east and the Philistines would have been on the west. And so look at verse 31. We get another judge. After him came Shamgar, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox gold. And he also saved Israel. And so the amount of time of oppression and the time of rest isn't given here, but he is a judge and we see his tremendous strength. He's able to take this stick that's only a few feet long with a sharp blade attached to it. And he's able to take out 600 Philistines. And that's our third judge. Now we get into some familiar territory to judges that some of us may know. And in chapter four, we get the story of Deborah and Barak. And these two judges deliver from the king of Canaan. His name is Jabin. He did in verse two, the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan. And so Deborah is a prophetess and a judge at the time. She's judging Israel and she summons Barak and says to him, go march and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali and Zebulun and draw out to Sisera. And the Lord says, I will give you him into your hand. But Barak is a coward. He gets scared. He says, I won't go unless you go with me. He says in verse eight, if you go with me, then I'll go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she says, surely I'll go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take. The Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah says, I'll go with you. But the glory is going to go to the woman because of this. And sure enough, that's what happened. They mount up their 10,000 men, verse 14, and the Lord routed Sisera, and that Sisera fled away on foot. And so he goes and he hides in the tent of this lady by the name of Jael, who is the wife of Heber, the Kidnite. And she gives him something to drink. She tells him, don't be afraid. And while he was sound asleep because he was exhausted, she takes a pig with a hammer in her hand and drives it into his temple in verse 21. And that's the story. And that's how the glory goes to a woman. And they get 40 years of relief because of this. And after they get this victory, they sing a song. And it's so much that goes on in this song. They even talk trash about Cicero's mama. We get the first your mama jokes here. Verse 28, it says, out of the window. She looks and lamented the mother of Sisera through the lattice. Why does his chariot delay and not come? Why do the hoof beats of his chariot tarry? So they're talking about the mother there. But the main point to all of this is not that God gave them the victory. You actually see them criticizing the other parts of Israel in this song for not helping them. And what does this do? It just further cements and shows that the fracturing that we talked about with them having no leader to unite them, it's just further developing and dividing them. And we're seeing that cycle over and over again, that they sin, they repent, God gives them judges, delivers them, they don't appreciate it, they fall into the cycle of sinning again, and we're getting this over and over. And I want you all to have that grid when you're thinking about this, because just in one review, we've covered four judges already, and we'll be on Gideon next. And I know you know the story of Gideon, but now learn it in the context of this, that he's just a judge that God is raising up during this time where there is no king. And we're going to start to see the thing that when there is no king, people do what is right in their own eyes. And that's going to be the thing. And I don't know if I've given us a thing for the book of Judges. The thing for the book of Judges is as bad as it gets. And if we want to use a fancy word for that, let's call it degradation. That's the thing. And that just means decline, downfall, because this is where Israel is in this chapter. The takeaway that we walk home with today is that when there is no king, when you have no authority, you will do what is right in your own eyes. This is an admonishment to make sure that our authority is Yahweh and make sure that our instruction is his words and his commands. That's why we were constantly told to follow all that he gives us, because if we don't, we end up here in Judges. This is what small deviations create. First, it starts off as a stretch fracture, 
And then it becomes the Grand Canyon. And we don't want to end here. So let's not do what is right in our own eyes. Let's not listen to the culture. Let's not listen to the world and their ideologies and their lust of the flesh, their lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Let's listen to Yahweh and follow him forever all the days of our lives. We'll pick up with the next few judges next time. But until the end, you guys take care.